So another year has come and gone, and with that, a lot of life's inevitabilities have passed us by. Things like death, taxes, elections, and the rising tide of fascism have all just passed right by weirdly quick, at least in my opinion, weirdly quick. And we don't want to think about that. We want to escape that through the medium of books. So this is, I think, the third year in a row I've done this. Just let's look back at everything I read this year. Let's talk about the best stuff, the worst stuff, the weirdest, the stupidest. Just give a nice little recap. Let's let's see what's been going on. And as a reminder, this is stuff that I read this year, not stuff that was released this year necessarily, because I think out of all the like 60 plus books I read this year, I think one or two of them came out this year is, I don't know, I, I don't read stuff as it comes out very often. Starting off, let's talk about the biggest disappointment I read this year, and that was The Dinosaur Lords. Now, let me be clear, I actually like The Dinosaur Lords, I think it's a very good series, you can watch my review of it if you haven't already, but I, it doesn't have an ending is the main thing. You know, the author planned for there to be six books and he died after writing the first three, so I got really into the story and then found out right at the end that, oh, there's never going to be more, so I'm left with all these lingering questions, you know? Like, it, it's, it's a real shame, you know, because it's basically just epic fantasy, but with dinosaurs. You know, it's a low fantasy setting, or at least it seems so at first, uh, so there's not that much magic, it is mostly just people with medieval technology, and then they incorporate dinosaurs into the everyday life, and into agriculture, and into uh, warfare, and things like that, and it's really, really cool and really interesting, and the characters are fun, the world is fun. It's just, it, it's a great series, and I was very, very disappointed to know that I will never get to see how these characters end up, and I will never get to find out the answers to all of the questions about the nature of Paradise. It's unfortunate, but it did happen. The best pleasant surprise I read this year was Guards of the Shadowlands. Now, again, you can watch my review of this if you're curious. This one I really did not expect much from, you know? Like, I read a lot of audiobooks, or <laughs> listen to a lot of audiobooks, I should say, uh, because I'm just, you know, driving a lot, and I need something to occupy my mind while that's happening. And I also, you know, have to pay attention to the road, so I tend not to go for complicated stuff while I'm... or complicated stuff for audiobooks, I should say. And that unfortunately means I have re listened to a whole bunch of young adult stuff this year, which I'm gonna have to try and change next year. Uh, and Guards of the Shadowlands was one of those, you know? It just looked like something simple and short that I might think is fine when I was done with it, uh, but actually wound up being really good. Because it's a story about basically this girl whose friend commits suicide and winds up going to hell, and she knows that she's in hell because she also attempted suicide, at some point earlier, and so now she can actually see into the underworld, kind of, and she decides, you know what, I'm gonna go there and I'm gonna rescue my friend, and that is basically what happens. The whole thing winds up being a weird metaphor for, not just for depression and why people commit suicide in the first place, but uh, more of a metaphor for helping your loved one through mental problems, like whether they're depressed or they're an alcoholic or they have anxiety or anything like that. Uh, and I really liked the way that was done, and I really liked the message that it eventually got to. And, obviously, we see the main character, like, fighting demons and stuff, which is a lot of fun. And then, this series does get worse in the second and third books because, well, to put it bluntly, the, sh the story just gets a lot more unfocused and kind of repetitive, but it's never terrible. You know, even in the latter half of the final book, when I was just begging for things to hurry up and end because it was really stretched out, I still enjoyed myself, and I wasn't expecting anything from this, so to go into it and just think, yeah, that was pretty good. That was a very pleasant surprise. The best nonfiction I read this year was The Bronze Lie by Mike Cole, and this one is pretty simple in concept. It's basically the whole idea that Sparta was this, you know, unparalleled military force in the ancient world, and the whole book is just saying, no, that's not true. In fact, it's complete bullshit. The Spartans lost a lot. Like, they, they lost more than they won, quite frankly. Like, their most famous engagement was at Thermopylae. Guess what? They fucking lost. And the Spartans didn't even make up a majority of the force there, despite what George Miller and Zack Snyder would have you believe. And don't get me wrong, I like the movie 300, but... 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 It's not true. It's not real. Like, they lost that. They lost most of the engagements against Athens and their allies during the Peloponnesian War. They lost most of their battles in the Archaic period, like 
way before we have good written records. Uh, they lost to Thebes after the Peloponnesian War, and then they lost to Rome and whoever else afterwards. Like, they, they just weren't that good at war, and the whole thing is propaganda. And I know many of you are sitting there, like, feeling rage, building at the base of your skull, and trying to say, actually, it's not true. Like, but where's your actual evidence of that? Like, you can actually look at the records of all the battles Spartans fought in. They lost a lot, and all you have are, like, half-remembered anecdotes from internet comments and stuff. Like, that that's where the myth of Spartan warrior supremacy comes from, really. But anyways, yeah, the Bronze Lie, it was a little verbose at times, but not that hard to get into for a history book. If you're if you're interested in the subject, I would recommend checking it out. It's 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 a good one. The most popular book I read and reviewed this year that I've never really seen anyone else talk about is The Chemist. And this one I talked about before was it's written by Stephanie Meyer who wrote The Twilight Books, and it was written after she was already really famous. So I'm not sure why it just didn't take off at all. I, I think it might just be because it's not really in the genre she's known for. You know, it's a spy thriller. It's a... takes place in the real world, there's no magical or supernatural elements or anything. And yeah, there is a weird romance in there, but it's not the focus of the story. Uh, and it especially doesn't seem like it would be the focus of the story based on the summary, so anyone looking for a romance wouldn't really be uh, reading this in the first place. So it's just... I don't know, it's, it's just odd that it's in this position. You know, it's not even like the worst book ever, it's not very good, but it's not even the worst book ever or all that strange or anything. It's just strange how a, a lot of people have apparently read it. It was a bestseller, it has a lot of ratings and reviews on Goodreads and stuff, but just no one's ever talked about it except me. It's... it's odd. The funniest book series I read this year was The Immortals, aka Evermore, and Man, I'm sorry, this is the second video in a row where I've talked about Evermore and I haven't quite finished it yet, so I haven't gotten to make the whole big video about it. I'm, I'm hoping to either get that put together in late December or early January, and then it should be released sometime in January either way, but I don't know, I'm almost done. But man, this is another one of those Twilight ripoffs that came out in the early aughts and the, or excuse me, the late aughts and the early 2010s, and... It's just so bad in every way, but it's bad in, like, a crazy, fun way. Like, the basic idea behind it is that the main character, Ever, her name is Ever Bloom, by the way, that's her actual name, and her boyfriend is named Damon August. <laughs> these, these names are amazing. But the whole thing is that uh, uh, Damon is immortal, and over the past couple hundred years, ever keeps being reincarnated and then dying before he and her can be together. And you might recognize this as the exact same plot that was in Fallen and Elixir, <laughs> which I've already talked about. And Evermore came out first, though, out of all these. And it's just beautiful. But, like, to give you an idea of just how freaking stupid this gets, the main conflict of the entire series for several books is that the two main characters cannot have sex. Like, they get a curse put on them so that Damon will die if the two of them bone. That's... <laughs> I'm not making that up at all. So they just have to try and find ways around that, including, like, magical full-body condoms and stuff. It's... it's beautiful. It's a mess, and it's beautiful. Like, <laughs> I just cannot wait to talk to you guys about it more, or talk about it with you guys more, but... Oh, God, it... it's amazing. It's the funniest thing I've read this year by far, and it was not intended to be funny at all. The worst romance I read this year, and keep in mind this is not the worst romance book I read this year, but the worst romance in any genre, uh, is Ever and Damon from Evermore. <laughs> and, man, I can't, uh, I can't go into a whole lot of detail about that again, because it would just take a long time, but they're both kind of awful people who don't spend much time thinking about how their actions affect other people around them, including each other. Like, they're manipulative to each other. Damon like a lot of love interests in this genre for some fucking reason, is just possessive and borderline abusive to ever. He kind of sort of makes her immortal against her will and keeps her away from her family. It's... Oh god, it is a mess. They, they're horrible people. <laughs> like, it's... No, it, it's the worst romance I read this year. That's all. The runner-up for the worst romance I read this year would be Eden and Bramford from Save the Pearls. Now... <sighs> I'll get more into Save the Pearls in later in this video, don't worry. And I already spent two and a half hours going over it, but... Man, just like Ever and Damon, they are fucking horrible people, both on their own merits and to each other. Like, 
Bramford, at one point, straight up locks her in a cell because he wants to prevent her from making trouble, which is just super romantic, I guess. Ever hates him, and then she loves him, and then she hates him, and then she loves him for no real reason. Like, they don't know each other all that well, other than him being her boss at the beginning of the series. And I, I can't even explain it. It's just literally from paragraph to paragraph, she will change whether she is in love with him or whether she hates him more than she'll ever know. And the only reason she winds up really liking him and eventually getting married to him is because she has like a weird fetish for black people. And then he turns himself into a furry and she also is a furry apparently. It's like, it's dumb, okay? Like, I don't know if I would use the word toxic exactly to describe it because I don't know if that's the most accurate thing because they're both just insane assholes. And in a weird way, they kind of deserve each other. The best romance I read this year was Hunter and Kate from the Elemental series, specifically from Spirit, which is the third book in the series because Kate is only in that one book. And the thing about this is they aren't the main pairing, so they do not get all that much screen time and not as much as they deserve, in my opinion, really. But they are both kind of bad people, right? Like, when we meet them, they've both done some bad things in their past, and they continue to do some crappy things as we uh, go along in the story. But both of them also are trying to change and trying to be better, and they both inspire each other to be better, and it just feels really natural that they would start developing feelings for one another. And it, unfortunately, they do not get a happy ending, and it's uh, kind of sucks. I don't want to go like too deep into spoilers or anything, but they unfortunately do not get a happy ending, but it works out well. They, I don't have a whole lot else to say about it, but they are just the best romance I read this year because they're very genuine and they make each other better people. The best pet in a book I read this year is Shira from the Dinosaur Lords. Now, again, in the Dinosaur Lords, people use dinosaurs in warfare and stuff, and uh, the not quite protagonist of the series, but the closest thing to a protagonist the series has is named Kareel, and he has a pet Allosaurus that he rides into battle, and her name is Shira. And Shira's such a, she's just a good girl, okay? I can't, I can't help it. She's, we see things from her perspective several times, and she's an intelligent animal. She's about as smart as a dog, you know, and she's very well trained. You know, she does not attack people unless she's told to. Uh, she goes into battle trying to protect her master and trying to protect other people and she will die for them. She will sacrifice herself for them, but she also will not take any shit from people who don't deserve it, like from other dinosaurs or from people who try to kill her or try to kill her master or anything like that. And she also has this really great rivalry with a T-Rex who betrays them near the beginning. It's, a, it's hard to explain, but like watching her hate him and then eventually fight him more and more is just, it's great. Shira, Shira's a good girl. I wish we got more of her. The book I read this year that makes me wonder the most why it exists is uh, Zabiba and the King by Saddam Hussein. Y you didn't mishear that. Saddam Hussein wrote a romance novel while he was president of Iraq, and it got published. I could go into a bit more detail about, like, what exactly happens in the story and everything, but that's not that important. I just tell you the basic idea of Saddam Hussein wrote a romance novel, and... That's why I'm wondering, why the hell does this exist? This, uh... Th this is a thing. Okay. And that, that's about all I have to say about it for now. The most boring climax I read this year was in Unearthly, or more specifically, in the last book in the series, which is Boundless. And, uh... Yeah, there's not a lot to say about that. Like, main character's friends gets kidnapped and taken to hell, or not really kidnapped, she kind of voluntarily went there. It's stupid. Uh, and then they just sort of stab a fallen angel with, like, a sword made of God's grace. It's, it's like a friendship blade, basically. And they stab him, and, excuse me, and he just immediately decides he doesn't want to be evil anymore. And he also goes back up to heaven because his sins have been cleansed, which... It seems like an easy way out of your sins, I, I gotta be honest. Like, especially considering he's a several thousand year old fallen angel who's been torturing people in hell for millennia whatever, it's okay, whatever, it's like, the the whole climax is over very, very quickly, too. Like, it's not built up to, it happens very quickly, and the events themselves are not very satisfying. They just sort of stab this dude, and then all their problems are solved. It's a not a good way to handle the ending to your series. Like, a climax doesn't necessarily need to be action-packed, 
but it does need to be the most emotionally resonant part of the story. And if it's like a romance or something, it could be, you know, that cliche of, oh, driving to the airport before they leave forever to tell them that you love them, or the characters finally get married, or something like that. But it can't be this. The best fantasy series I read this year was Del Toro Quest. And I know what you might be thinking, like, James, this was written for kids, how could it be that great? Well, so was The Hobbit and The Chronicles of Narnia, and those are all fantastic books that have stuck around for decades because they have something for people of all ages, and Del Toro Quest does too. It's a very, well, it seems like a very simple story at first, and in broad strokes it is. It's basically just heroes go from place to place to collect all the gems for the belt of Del Toro so that they can use it to get rid of the evil Dark Lord who has invaded and corrupted their land. Like, it's, it's pretty good, and watching them go along this journey and get to know each other better and rely on each other is great, and most of the time when they get into trouble, they don't just fight their way out of it. They have to think their way out of it, and there's a bunch of puzzles and stuff that uh, you as a reader can actually stop and look at it and try and solve yourself if you feel like it. It's, it's really great for kids, and then near the end the story does get a bit more complex, and there are some good twists and turns, and the characters become much deeper than they initially seemed. It's like, it's just a great read, you know? Like, if you're looking for something to read to your kids that you also would enjoy, I would say check that out. And if you remember seeing it when you were younger but you never got around to it, like, which is what I did, then I'd recommend going for it. You know, they're short books and they go by quick. The worst fantasy I read this year, by far, bar none, not even a contest, is The Fifth Sorceress. I mean, like, look, I spent three hours complaining about this series a while ago. Like. There, the, everything bad that you can imagine in an epic fantasy story is in here. You have inbreeding, you have villains that self-sabotage, you have a main character who's like whiny and annoying and goes, oh, I don't want to be a prince, I don't want to have responsibilities, but he's also like the best at everything, you're the greatest sword fighter ever, and all the ladies are just constantly trying to have sex with him because he's just such a chad, and he, he's an idiot as well, and... Then we have nonsensical magic and villain plans that don't make sense. Like, it's just, it's painful. It's dumb. There are very few things in there that are any good, and there are very few things in there that even seem like they have potential to be good. The Fifth Sorceress has been out for, what, 20 years now? And it's become infamous as one of the worst epic fantasy ever written in that time period, and for good reason. It's terrible. There's almost nothing good here to talk about. And the runner-up for the worst fantasy I read this year would be Lightlark. Now, Lightlark is, again, somewhat infamous, but it's also much more recent. It only came out a few months ago. And if I had to describe it, it's basically just The Hunger Games, except it takes place in a fantasy world. And also it's bad. Like, you know, The, the Hunger Games worked because it kept, like, the rules of the contest simple. You know, there's 24 people go in, one of you gets to leave. Do what you will. You know, like, just kill each other, try not to die try not to starve because they're in the wilderness, you know, it, it's pretty simple. Whereas Lightlark has all these Byzantine rules which don't really make any sense and it doesn't seem all that deadly to be honest because most people who have participated in the contest before haven't died and even outside that the world doesn't make any sense, like it's just way too chipper and happy uh, even when it's trying to be darker and edgier. Uh, the powers and curses don't really make sense because like every kingdom has a unique set of powers that they can use, but that every kingdom also has a curse that they have to live with. And to give you an idea of just how dumb these get, the Skylings, their power is that they can fly, and their curse is that they can't fly. It's, it's dumb. Like, And the story is obviously not that great. The characters are somehow less than two-dimensional. It's like, it's, it's not good. Like, it's not as bad as the fifth sorceress, and hell, I wouldn't even say it's as bad as a lot of people are saying, but that might just be because I do see some potential in some of these ideas that are brought up. It's just, it's a mess. Like, I, I feel as if if the author had gotten a better editor, or maybe just listened to the one she had, then we might have gotten a decent middle grade fantasy or something, but as it stands right now, Lightlark is just, it, it's pretty bad. It's not, like, offensively bad. It doesn't make me angry with how bad it is, the way the fifth sorceress does, but it's just not good. 
The book this year that I did not actually read, but I know I should have gotten to, is The Lost Metal. I know, I know, like, but by the time this video comes out, I will probably have at least started on The Lost Metal, but it's just, I, I haven't gotten around to it. You know, I have other stuff I'm trying to read. I, like I said, Evermore, I'm trying to get through, and I know, I'm sorry, I'll get to it. The series I read this year that I just wonder why did I do this uh, is Matched. It's not even that Matched is like the worst thing I read this year. It's just, why? You know, why Why did I bother doing that to myself? Like, again, it's an audiobook because I just go through a bunch of those while I'm driving all the time, but uh, why? I, I don't get it. Like, it's not even the worst thing ever. It's just, wh why? I don't know. The dumbest twist I read this year is from 172 Hours on the Moon, and, um, oh boy, let me tell you, like, that story is basically just about a couple of teenagers who win a contest uh, so that they can go to the moon. You know, they, they get to go there on a manned mission and hang out in a moon base for a little while and stuff, and it sounds like a lot of fun, but it's also hinted from early on that there is some nefarious stuff going on or mysterious, dangerous stuff going on on the moon. And it's just not a good book. Uh, one of the problems is that they don't even reach the moon until more than halfway through. And then once they're there, the supernatural occurrences start happening, and it's a little spooky. It's a little creepy, I'll give it that. But then, like, the big twist is that the moon is hell. Like, like, literally. Like, that's where the souls of the damned go. Like, if you've sinned a whole bunch in your life, then when you die, you go to the moon. And so there's demons and shit on the moon. It's dumb. I hated it. Just, no, no. No, just, it's the dumbest thing I read this year. Or dumbest twist I read this year, I should say. The book series I read this year that is the most, like, okay, I guess? And by that I mean, I finished it, and I look back on it, and I go, yeah, that was, that, that was okay, I guess. Like, it was, it was fine. It, it elicits no strong reactions at all. It is Under the Never Sky. Uh, take a wild guess. Again, audiobooks. I just was looking for something to get through. And originally I was actually planning on doing some sort of comparison between this and Breathe, because those are both series that came out around the same time and had very similar setups, but Under the Never Sky, number one, turned out to be a bit different than I anticipated, and number two, there's just... I have, like, nothing to say about it. Like, everything in there is just kind of fine. You know, characters, dialogue, the story itself, the world building, the setup. It's just fine. You know, and there's no deeper way to explore that, really. Like, the, the only thing I remember kind of liking all throughout the series was the main romance, and even then, um, that's not featured as much in the second and third book as in the first, so... Yeah, I, I just, I have nothing to say. Like, I look back on Under the Never Sky and I go, yeah, that's that, that, that okay, I guess. The most useless magical creatures I read about this year are the gnomes from the fifth sorceress. Like... If you've read this, you know what I'm talking about. Like, th their whole job is to just guard this one little hidden forest area, which is also where they live, and they can't do that. Like, both before the story begins, they fail a whole bunch and people break in there. Uh, when the heroes show up pretty early on, they fail to keep them out, but, I mean, it's fine because they're the heroes and they don't want to hurt anybody. And then later, villains keep coming in and attacking them, and the gnomes are just, they just suck at what they're doing. <laughs> Like, even though they try to act like they're these powerful guards that will keep any intruders out, like, they just, they just can't do it. They're, they're useless, and they don't even have any other skills. Like, they don't tell the characters any useful information. They don't uh, help, help them in their quest in any other way by, like, sneaking into areas and doing anything. Like, there's, no, they're, they're just useless. They do nothing. All right, we're near the end, so now I can just talk about the worst book series I read this year. Should be no surprise if you follow me closely. It saved the pearls, man. Like, God, there is just nothing here that is good. E everything about it is terrible and is either annoying or makes me angry. Like, it's a trend chaser. It's riddled with grammatical errors. The world it takes place in is dumb and doesn't make any sense either scientifically or within this book's own internal logic. It doesn't, it's just nothing about it fits together the way it should. The characters are all dicks. Like, I touched upon this a little bit earlier with Eden and Bramford, but they're just awful people, both to each other and to everyone else. Like, there's a point in, near the end of the first book where Eden just sends out the location of this hidden village 
to the world, and then soldiers come in and attack it, and then in the next book, they all have to evacuate and move somewhere else. Like, and at no point does anyone bring up that this is Eden's fault. Like, <laughs> she's the one that did this to them, and no one ever calls her out on it or anything. Uh, Bramford, like I said, he keeps secrets from her, he locks her in an actual cell at one point, uh, he's semi-abusive towards his son, but it's he says it's for his own good, uh, he's obsessed with his ex-wife even while he's now in a new relationship, uh, and then Eden's father, like, experiments on her against her will and things like that, like, every character in this is just an asshole, and then the story is just it's just complete nonsense. Like, it starts off as like, okay, there's this horrible government that the characters need to work against, and you think that's what it's gonna be about. And then they just escape into the jungle, and they're just kinda hanging out there without much real conflict, other than Eden and Bramford slowly falling in love. Although I don't know if that's even really considered a conflict, because it's just the two of them getting closer. Uh, I should put quotes around the word closer, because again, it's a terrible romance. But And then in the second book, Eden decides she wants to become a furry, and she wants to turn everyone in the world into furries in order to get rid of racism, and also she's an Aztec god, and if she can take her place as an Aztec god, it can bring balance to the world, and it will no longer be destroyed. Like, it is just fucking nonsense, man. <laughs> like, nothing here is good. And I haven't even touched on the racism, which is the main thing people talk about when they talk about this series, for good reason. It is extraordinarily racist. But... The thing is, when everyone is talking about that all the time, and, like, that's the main thing they focus on, people tend to forget just how shit it is outside of that. Like, it's not as if uh, if you removed all the weird racial stuff, the story would suddenly be good. It wouldn't be. It would still be shit. So, for that reason, yeah, Save the Pearls is the worst series I read this year. It didn't actually get an ending. Uh, like, the author just never published the third book, even though it was planned. And... Part of me is kind of curious to see where it would go, because these were, you know, kind of funny at a few points, just because of, again, how freaking bonkers and off the rails they got. Uh, but at the same time, I'm just, I, I'm glad it's done, and I'm glad I didn't have to go through another 300 pages of that shit. The best book I read this year was The Dinosaur Knights, and that's the second book in the Dinosaur Lords series. Like, I wanted to single this one out because of the half of a series that we got, it is the best one by far. It wraps up the original story arc of the characters just trying to protect this one area, and then the villains being, you know, this massive kingdom that wants to just come in and cleanse everyone because they're heretics. Uh, and we also finally get introduced to the Grey Angels, who seem like they were going to be the main villains of the series because they just want to wipe out all of humanity. And we see them in action, and we're like, holy shit, these things are scary, and we see them raise these entire armies, and it's also a weird uh, play on the zombie apocalypse trope, because the Grey Angels can, mm, how do I put this, brainwash people, I guess you'd say, uh, but the thing is they keep all their mental faculties. They can still think and talk and problem solve and everything. They are just so fanatically devoted to the Grey Angels and to uh, performing this crusade and cleansing the world of heresy that they will come at you with their bare hands or with a weapon or whatever, and you, you have to kill them <laughs> beforehand. Like, you can cut them in half, and they will crawl on the ground towards you and keep going. So it's like a, you know, it's a swarm of zombies almost when you fight them, except these zombies can still think and still use weapons and stuff. So it's, it's an interesting take on it, and you see how the religious fanaticism of this world works, and you can see some of the dangers of real-world religious fanaticism, and... The character arcs don't exactly wrap up, but several of them move forward in very satisfying ways. Like, it's just a perfectly paced story. We see more of the world. It, it's great. And I wish it was in a series that got to be completed. Maybe it would be the best part of it. Maybe it wouldn't be. Maybe it would get even better later on. I don't know. But I do have to say the, bit, the best, like, single book I read this year was The Dinosaur Knights. And that is the end of another video, which marks the end of another year, or... Maybe this will come out at the beginning of January, I'm not totally sure, but, you know, I just, uh, I didn't have a long speech or anything to go through this year, you know, I just wanted to thank all of you for sticking with me this whole time through. Uh, if you are new this year, then welcome, I'm glad you found me. If you've been around for a while, then I'm glad you stuck with me. And to those who have left over the time, <laughs> over the past 12 months, or even before that, I mean, I 
don't hold any hard feelings, you know, sometimes my content changes and it's just not what you're looking for anymore. Sometimes you change and I'm just not what you're looking for anymore and that's fine, you know? I'm glad we had that time together. I'm glad you decided to spend some of your finite amount of time on this earth uh, watching whatever nonsense it is that I put out. <laughs> I never intended for YouTube to be my career, like it was my main job for a couple of years, but now I have like an actual one and this is more just a hobby that I do that also I happen to get paid for. And I I always wanted for that to be the case, you know, I, I was never planning to be a professional YouTuber or anything, it just sort of fell in my lap. And I don't want to be for a couple of reasons, but the biggest one being that a lot of YouTubers just wind up chasing trends and they wind up telling their audience what they want to hear, uh, even if they're not consciously aware of it, that's just what they do because, you know, that's what gets more engagements, that what, that's what gets more views, that's what gets more subscribers, and it's especially noticeable with, like, political pundits and stuff, but it happens to the best of us, at least sometimes, and I didn't want that to happen to me, you know? I just want to put out the stuff that I enjoy making, because if I'm just putting stuff out just to chase the algorithm or just to chase trends or something, then it just becomes work, you know, it's, it's regular work, it's no longer fun, which is why I started doing it in the first place. And I never want to reach that point, you know? I, I am disappointed when stuff I put out doesn't do super well, obviously, but it's not the end of the world. You know, my livelihood doesn't really depend on it, so I can just put out whatever weird topics or weird things I've been thinking about lately. And, yeah, I don't know. I'm just, I'm glad all of you could be here. Uh, I hope that your year went well for you. It, as good if not better than mine, and I hope next year treats you well too. And I will see all of you in 2023. Goodbye. Huge thanks to everyone who watched this whole thing, all of my nonsense that I put out there, it's appreciated. Uh, and a huge thanks to all my patrons as well, especially my $10 and up patrons, whose names are Oppo Sabalanen, Olivia Rayen, Brother Santotis, Buffy Valentine, Carolina Clay, Dan Antselievich, Dark King, Dio, Echo, Flax, Great Grebo, Johnny St. Clair, Karkat Kitsune, Liza Rudakova, Lord Tiebreaker, Microphone, Mistboy, Peep the Toad, Robbie Reviews, Sad Mardigan, Sillier the Vixen, Stone Stairs, Tesla Shark, Vivictus, and Wesley. And of course, everyone else whose names you see here. Uh, if you want to get your name put on here, consider becoming a patron. And if you don't feel like doing that, you can also like be a channel member or just like the video and subscribe. You know, share share it around. Help help more people see my genius. I'm not appreciated enough. Uh, anyways, uh, see you later.